black. Oh, I got the ethics committee again. You're lying. Maybe. Okay, there we go. Now I've got the agenda. This is Senate Finance. Um, today is April 6th. And today we are going to uh, do a week primarily devoted to broadband. So um, we can really focus in uh, the field of possible things we can do seems to keep expanding. And I think we're gonna work our way through it, but, and this is just so technical. Um, I wanna work our way through this one. Uh, we may take a break and see if we can get some other bills that we can get out in a hurry. I am still communicating with the house, trying to see if we couldn't put that insurance bill we did Friday. If uh, house healthcare is not taking testimony until Thursday, uh, they have jurisdiction over health insurance in the other body. The insurance bill we passed out, as far as I know, is still sitting in commerce. And I've been encouraging them to think about maybe if they agree or even if they don't agree with us to attach something to that insurance bill because that's an S and it's over there and it will probably make it through the system. Whereas if we have to get an S bill there and get it taken up, it may well not make it in time is of the essence in this one. I've also requested a hearing before rules, which is where our committee bill got sent today. And hopefully we can get it out of there ASAP and get it on its way to the other body in whatever form. So that said, um, Maria, you're that's right, you were gonna give us, we have H360 and S118, and you were gonna kind of walk us through a side-by-side -side of mm -hmm. these. Okay. Yes, exactly. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen, if that's okay, because I have a document that I think will help us keep things organized. Um, <sighs> Okay, can everybody see that pretty well? Of this, by the way, is it on uh, our website at this point? I believe it is posted under my name for today. Okay. And in, so- In order to see all of this, I'm gonna have to make you all go away. So if you have a question, just holler. <laughs> um, Okay, Maria. Okay. Great. So this is basically a section by section summary of both bills. H360 has passed the House, so the House broadband bill, and S118 as introduced, Senator Brock's broadband bill. Um, and so you had a section by section summary of H360. So that's basically in the left hand column. And then I basically added on the right column kind of the corresponding provisions of S-118. And I've highlighted in yellow kind of some key areas, you know, that I really wanted to focus on. So we'll just start going through um, and things will, I think, also become clearer as they get fleshed out um, in the specific provisions. But couple of things to state at the outside. So the House proposes creation of, of a new authority, the Vermont Community Broadband Authority, whereas S-118 um, creates a new entity, it basically reconstitutes the Vermont Telecommunications Authority. But two of the key distinctions are, one, the VTA under S-118 uh, is charged with promoting not just fixed broadband service, but mobile telecommunications, which was not addressed in H360. Also, in the House proposal, there's a real focus on community broadband solutions, meaning CUDs. 
I, th I think all of the funding, all of the programs are designed to uh, give funds specifically to CUDs, either alone, jointly, or in partnership with other entities. Um, whereas S-118, uh, the scope is a little bit broader. Uh, you'll see in the eligibility provisions, you know, specific requirements. But if you kind of make those two distinctions, one, the house side is just broadband, fixed broadband. The money goes to CUDs, essentially. And then on the S-118 side, it includes mobile services, and it's also much broader in terms of where that money can go. In terms of the organization of these two entities, um, the very first kind of distinction has to do with the number of members of the board of directors. Um, on the House side, there's seven. On the Senate, S-118 side, there are nine. Both have the Commissioner of Public Service. Both have members selected by VCUDA. That's um, the Vermont CUD Association that represents all the CUDs. You'll just notice that um, on the House side, there are two members selected by VCUDA under S-118, one member. House proposes one member appointed by the governor. S-118 has two members appointed by the governor. And in terms of the members appointed by the speaker and the committee on committees, the House says not legislators, whereas S-118 specifies that they are legislators, one representative, one senator. Then in terms of where there's no overlap, the House proposes that the Secretary of Commerce and Community Development is a member of this board. And on the Senate side, um, there's one member appointed by the Telephone Association of Vermont. This is the entity that represents the independent telephone companies. There's also a place for the um, CEO, the VT of the new authority, the chief administrative officer um, serves on the board and also a place for the treasurer. So that's just with respect to the organization of the board of directors. In terms of the qualifications of the public members, the House added very specific language to ensure that there is at least one public member with expertise in finance, uh, whereas S-118 lists finance as uh, something uh, to be considered when looking at the qualifications of the various members. The House has a kind of a conflict of interest provision that excludes any owner, employee, member of an ISP or CUD from being appointed a member. Um, there's not a similar conflict provision in S-118. Both bills specify that the board members serve three-year terms and then with respect to who serves as the chair and the vice chair of the board, on the House side, the chair and vice chair are elected from among the public members. In S-118, the governor appoints the chair with the advice and consent of the Senate. And then also with respect to the chair who serves on the board, who serves as a CEO, some specific requirements. Um, the chair is a state employee. The chair is exempt from the classified system and receives compensation equal to a superior judge. Um, so a little more uh, prescriptive on the role of the chair uh, and how it fits in with the state employee system. So both on the House and the Senate, that, that chair uh, or the executive director is the admin chief administrative officer. Um, and both have provisions for retaining or employing other technical experts and employees. Um, both bills create a special fund um, to be the repository of any funds received to support the programs. 
The big distinction here is what we talked about last week, that existing 0.4% of the universal service charge, which currently goes to the Department of Public Service, under the House proposal, that money is transferred to the new authority to pay for its operational expenses and any remaining funds to support the programs that are otherwise authorized under the new chapter. Then in terms of kind of the general powers and duties of the two entities, again, you know, just highlighting that on the House side, it's really focused around getting resources and support to the CUDs. On the S-118, it's resources to both mobile and fixed broadband providers. Um, a lot of similarity in terms of coordination, providing those resources to eligible entities, facilitating partnerships, applying for grants with eligible entities or on behalf of eligible entities, uh, consulting with VITA and the Municipal Bond Bank, consulting with state agencies on existing taxes and fees applicable, um, assisting with fiber route identification and poll surveys, identifying funding opportunities, all of those provisions are pretty much um, identical with the exception that some the house is geared towards CEDs and the S-118 is much broader. In terms of the provisions that are unique and, and with respect to general powers and duties, under the house proposal, the new authority provides input to the department on the 10-year telecom plan Whereas you can see on S-118, the new VTA would be responsible for developing the state's telecom plan. Back to the House side on the left, there's a provision that requires the new authority to assist the CUDs with business plans and also to do some advocating at the federal level um, for programs and support to assist Vermont projects. But then on the, in S-118, um, much broader charge. Um, well, first of all, there's reference to the existing high cost program. This is the subsidy program for the incumbent telephone providers who are the carriers of last resort that have build out requirements for providing basic phone service to Vermonters. This new VTA would take over administration of that program. Also, uh, the, the new VTA like the dormant VTA would be able to construct, install own infrastructure. Um, and then what's new vis-a-vis -vis the dormant VTA, this new entity would re be responsible for creating and maintaining service availability maps. A lot of that mapping is done now through the Department of Public Service. Also creating and maintaining an inventory of poll data Again, some of that data is collected by the department and VCGIS. Um, uh, and, and then the VTA would have responsibility for ensuring that the existing networks are secure and resilient, kind of a, a able reinforcing emergency preparedness. And you'll see a number of things that are listed there uh, that the VTA would review and oversee. Um, and the VTA has rulemaking authority. Both bills uh, exempt any trade secrets that the authority comes in possession of uh, from the Public Records Act. And then in terms of the allocation of funds under H360, you'll see a list of basically funding priorities. So for all of the programs that are funded through this new entity, there's a list of priorities that should be considered. Everything from getting serving unserved and underserved, supporting service of at least 100 megabits per second symmetrical, leveraging, leveraging federal and public private partnership resources, supporting low-income, disadvantaged communities, geographic diversity, affordable service, um, and kind of an open access, uh, not requirement, but 
um, looking at whether or not the infrastructure supports open access. In S-118, they're not listed as priorities, but there are some requirements related to eligibility for funding under the new VTA. So specifically for broadband projects, who's eligible, CUDs, the small independent telephone companies, electric cooperatives, and any other ISP, internet service provider, if the proposed project is consistent with policies and purposes of the chapter and otherwise in the best interest of the state. And that would be as determined by the new VTA. Projects eligible for, for funding must provide a minimum of 25-3 service and be capable of being upgraded to 100 symmetrical service. And then for any project, whether it's a mobile or a fixed broadband project, that that infrastructure is available for multiple service providers on a non-discriminatory basis and at rates deemed reasonable by the authority. So then on the house has a, a new program, a pre-construction grant program. So this would be anything from feasibility studies, business planning, engineering and design, make ready work. Um, there is not a similar program under S-118. I did put in italics there just as kind of a, as a refresher to keep in mind, you did allocate or you're proposing to allocate some federal money for CUD pre-construction costs and that's in H315, um, which I understand, I know, uh, Went from the House to the Senate, you made um, your revisions. It went back to the House. I think the House has some additional clarifications with respect to this program, but I wanted to keep it out there that there is some additional monies for pre-construction costs under consideration right now. Then in terms of construction money, whether it's grants or debt, um, the House has a, a construction grant and subordinated debt program. In S-118, um, the new authority or the VTA, the reconstituted VTA would again be responsible for the existing high cost program and the existing grant program, construction grant program, the connectivity initiative. And in terms of debt, uh, the new VTA would be responsible for creating a new communications infrastructure revolving loan program. And this would provide a continuous source of capital for both mobile and fixed broadband projects um, consistent with uh, the eligibility requirements that we reviewed in the previous section. Also, S-118 has the establishment of a broadband core to assist with the infrastructure and service deployment, outreach and technical support to Vermonters and specifically low-income inc Vermonters who may be eligible for subsidies. And this particular program would sunset in 2024. Um, there's also specific language about interagency cooperation and assistance. This is very similar to what the dormant VTA um, language included. What's, uh, it's a little bit broader though in S-118 and that it also includes um, specifically the E911 board. In terms of reporting requirements, um, very similar provisions with respect to an annual reporting requirement. S-118 also has uh, quarterly reporting requirements. And where the House proposes looking at, you know, reporting on in the annual report progress towards meeting the state's goal of 100 symmetrical service by 2024, in S-118, there's a specific requirement that the authority make a recommendation about a reasonable time frame for achieving the state's goal. In other words, if 2024 is not uh, reasonable to make a recommendation um, in 2022 about what 
might be reasonable. Both bills have a sunset. Um, that was the, excuse me, that was the state's goals on that last one? Yep. Time, reasonable yep. time frame so the for state achieving. The state's existing goal of 100 symmetrical service by 2024. Okay, I, I understand that, okay. Okay. So both, um, under both proposals, there's a sunset for the new authority in the house. They propose sunsetting the Vermont Community Broadband Authority in 2029. Under S-118, the sunset is 2026. And both proposals, um, you know, suggest that the authority can submit a recommendation for its continued existence, if that's appropriate. In terms of its initial organization and uh, office space allocation, uh, the provisions, the bills are very similar. A uh, couple of exceptions under S-118, the Commissioner of Public Service initially serves as the chair until the CEO is hired. You'll remember that the governor appoints um, the chair with the advice and consent of the Senate. Um, then also with respect to transferring any positions, the S-118 is a bit broader in the scope. Um, so it requests that the commissioner come up with a plan for transferring any relevant positions, programs, assets, liabilities, et cetera. And that plan uh, is reviewed at the initial, its initial organizational meeting, the VTA's initial organizational meeting and then by the Joint Fiscal Committee, submitted to the Joint Fiscal Committee for its approval. Uh, the House repeals the Innovation Grant Program. There's about $60,000 left in that program. Uh, that repeal is in 2022, so the department could get the remaining funds out the door. Um, there's a specific provision in the House for transferring the role broadband technical assistance specialist. Um, again, in S-118, there's a more general request for a transfer plan. Uh, as we went over, I think it was last week, um, and as I just highlighted at the beginning of the discussion, there's the provision relating to the 0.4% of the universal service charge going to the new authority. Um, also in the house bill, there's a provision relating to existing fiber assets that the department currently owns that came to the department from the VTA in 2015, that those assets are transferred to the CUDs where they're located if they want them. Uh, the House made some amendments to the existing connectivity initiative, the existing grant program. And as I mentioned earlier, S-118 proposes that the new VTA would take over administration of that existing connectivity initiative on passage. Uh, the Senate repeals the Telecommunications and Connectivity Advisory Board because this is a board that advises the department on grants and planning and so on, and the department would no longer be doing those, performing those functions um, under the Senate proposal or S-118 proposal. There are no amendments in S-118 or um, revisions to the existing broadband expansion loan program. This is the program that you created a couple of years ago that's administered by VITA. Uh, clarification regarding CUD trade secrets that they're exempt under the Public Records Act. Um, property tax exemption. Uh, there's not a corresponding provision in S-118, although you've looked at another proposal in Senator Bray's bill. And I know you're gonna um, hear more greater detail about that from Abby and Mark later in the week. Um, and then finally, well, not, not finally, in terms of the, some of the different provisions, it has the three kind of communications workforce provisions. We've gone over them already. 
Um, so they are out there for your consideration. In terms of S-118s, a provision that's not also in the House is a study uh, on potential bonding authority, use of the VTA's bonding authority, which is now dormant, and whether that's an opportunity that should be pursued in Vermont. Uh, that's a report that would be submitted by the VTA in 2022, and then any uh, findings and recommendations would be updated annually thereafter. In terms of the appropriations, um, the House uh, was very specific. I know in S-118, at the time it was introduced, there wasn't, nobody really knew what was going to happen at the federal level. Um, so in, the, in S-118, it really kind of mirrors the governor's recommendation um, for about $20 million of general fund dollars. I know that's now open for discussion. The House looked more specifically at the available federal funds under ARPA, the American Rescue Plan. And so uh, no, I won't go through detail. I know we're getting close to two o'clock here, but basically allocates $150 million to the new authority, 30 million for the pre-construction grant program, 120 million for the construction grant program, and then 100,000 for the communications workforce provisions. Um, some other transfer of existing grants and allow uh, some authority to expend anticipated receipts um, is referenced there. The House basically said for any federal funds available to the state to align um, those allocations consistent with what's been described in this in the House bill for the BCBA, its programs and purposes, and then just the effective date. Um, both are effective on passage, some exceptions in the House specific to their programs. So that's a broad overview of the proposals that you have in front of you to date. Okay, so this, they both envision, it sounds like, spending federal money. One is general fund, but I assume that might be being supplanted by some ARPA funds that are freeing up general fund, but it basically is federal money other than the 4% that's in the connectivity fund, that's all the state money. So we're gonna go through in whatever form we choose, 150, 200 million dollars, whatever we choose there of ARPA funds. And when that's done, we're done. Except the S bill has a revolving loan fund. So a revolving loan fund says that the money's not going to go away. The bulk of it should come back. So if we're going to take that route, we should um, think about who's going to decide how the rounds after that go out. I think that's, that's an excellent point. Yep, I'm glad you mentioned that. There may be some federal parameters about loans and to what extent they can revolve or if they need to be repaid to the treasury. And I think Senator Brock mentioned that too. There might be an opportunity for having some kind of revolving lending, but then before the deadline or before it has to go back to the treasury, maybe to give it out in the form of grants, if that makes sense. So I think that's an excellent issue, um, something that might depend a little bit more on treasury guidance about what you can do with federal funds. The other thing that I added to that is also the potential of using equity as opposed to lending uh, as another way of uh, prolonging the use of funds. So that we have a, a window in which we can look at options. And they, I think joint fiscal yeah. has been working, you know, running the, the, the kind of contact to find out what we can and can't do. So maybe as we work through this, my preference would be A, we have a committee discussion about our goals and where we want to go. The last thing on my 
list would be setting up the structure. The structure to me should reflect where we want to go. So Senator Sorotkin and Senator Pearson, and then um, we do have a witness waiting. So we you're, you're muted, Senator. My questions are very general. Um, is this approach to set up a brand new or reconstituted authority, is this supported fully by the administration or do they have some hope of keeping the power within the public service department? May I give a quick answer? Uh, I, I have had discussions, uh, extensive discussions with the administration and have participated in discussions with them about, uh, about this concept in general, uh, including having with the Public Service Commissioner. My sense is that there is support for this, provided that we don't create a monstrous bureaucracy in the process. And that's why we've included things such as, uh, as, as dates, suspense dates uh, to, to review where we are. But I do get a sense there is concern generally about the potential conflict of interest between the advocacy role and the regulatory role, which is one of the things that's, that's, that's driving the notion of creating uh, a separate entity to do this. And the distinction that jumps out at me between the House and the Senate version is the House seems to be directed towards publicly supported entities versus the private sector and um is is this model is there anything to be drawn from other states or are they all grappling with the same issue right now have they set up separate authorities for broadband and maybe mobile and do they go in one do the majority go in one direction versus the other cuds or cuds and the private sector yeah, I think we're going to, this is getting really into uh, a discussion about what is out there, what are our options. I'm trying to, we've got another witness waiting that I think has other options for us. And um, I want to make sure we have enough time there. So I've got Really quick, Senator Pearson, Senator Hardy, and then we're going to move along. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be quick. Um, th th this tension, or uh, you know, the dueling ideas of grants versus loans, relates to Senator Brock's comments about a capitalization. Um, I I hope we'll end up spending quite a bit of time in there. But um, one idea I've wondered about is. Because the loan idea lends to accountability, and we've seen other times when the grants don't, right? So could we explore an option? And I guess the question for you, Maria, is from what we're learning about ARPA and from the timeline, is it even realistic to consider, you know, this is a loan, but ARPA doesn't allow us to do loans, but it could become a grant if you hit some threshold in the next, I think we have three years, right? Do we have three years to get the money out the door or to have it, you know, spent and, and built or what? And yeah, anyway, so I I've just been check, wondering yeah. about that. Yep. I, I'll have to check on whether it's incurred or spent. Um, but I think you're right on three years. And um, uh, yeah, I, I will explore that and see what I can find out in terms of how much discretion you have and lending and then grants if thresholds are met, so. Thank you. And I do have, Senator Strzok, and I have, I can send you a link that NCSL prepared a list of what other states are doing with respect to creating entities, authorities, or offices or whatever. And I think you'll find that it's, it's there are many models. Um, some states are, you know, giving money predominantly to electric co-ops to do broadband. Some states are giving it all to, you know, the private sector. Some states are just auctioning it off to the best proposal. So I don't know if there are any 
themes, but then again, I haven't studied them and I haven't studied them recently, but I will send that link because it may be helpful to give you some ideas. Be great. Okay, Sandra Hardy. I'll just be really quick. I, I just want to be careful that um, I, I appreciate the the side by side comparison to the H three sixty and S one eighteen, but S one eighteen is not the Senate's position. It is a bill that's been introduced right. by one senator and co sponsored right. by others, and we have not passed it, not even in committee. So, with all due respect to Senator Brock, I just want to make sure that people listening are aware that it's just a bill. It's not something that's been passed by the full Senate. Right. So thank you. Yeah, these are two proposals that have been brought to us and I'm quite sure we're gonna hear more. So, um, and then we're gonna sit down and decide what we wanna do and then we will figure out the best way to do it. So at this point, um, next on the agenda is Tom Absalon. And Tom, I, there you are, you have popped up. Um, and you're the former Vermont Chief Recovery Officer and co-founder of Broadband Equity Now. So I think you've got a longer history than that. <laughs> if that's what you, you've given us, that's it. Um, but the floor is yours, welcome. I know last time we worked on broadband and telecommunications, both you and Mary were here a lot. Um, so welcome back and the floor is yours. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And, and Vice Chair and Senators, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Madam Chair, I do speak for Mary in this case as, as well, as you remember, uh, we are a team um, Faith, is it possible for me to share my screen and share the presentation? It is. You're now co-host. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so I think you now see my screen. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, as Senator Brock said very forcefully yesterday, all the infrastructure and technology in the world doesn't do any good unless people are able to, unless people can actually access it. And when Vermont kids have to drive to the parking lots of McDonald's to try to do their homework, it's not only those kids that lose, it's our whole educational network that loses, that can't reach its complete potential. And when an elderly person who can't get to the doctor also can't do telehealth, it's not only that elderly person who loses but our whole health system that loses. Uh, when people can't work from home in Vermont, it's not only the people who can't work from home that lose, uh, but it's Vermont's opportunity uh, for economic development, which loses as well. Right now, we really have an opportunity, I think, to close the broadband gap that's been deviling us for so long. Uh, now, uh, with new technology, Affordability is really the main obstacle to every Vermont family having access to broadband. If we look at the, at the current status of broadband availability, about 50% of Vermont families live in places where there's both good broadband available um, and where the ISPs have low income programs. So those 50% of families, rich or poor, um, have access uh, and can use that access. Another 35% of Vermont families live in places where broadband's available, uh, some of it where it's become recently available, territory like EC Fiber, for example, with very good broadband availability, but it's expensive. Uh, so for the low-income families that live in those neighborhoods, the broadband might as well not be there. They can't afford $100 a month for an EC Fiber plant, even though there's very, very good broadband in their neighborhood. Then there's another 15% of Vermonters who live in the area that until the beginning of this year, we considered there to be no broadband available at all. It's the um, 60,000 families that are on, 60,000 addresses that are on the DPS map and shown as on served. With new technology, um, actually broadband is available there, but also very, very expensive. So even though Wealthy Vermonters in that area are arranging for broadband access. Uh, that other 15% of Vermonters can't afford broadband access either. 
I think with the new technology and with the rescue funds, um, we can close that gap. So what we're asking for very specifically um, is $6 million. These would come from ARPA funds, and uh, I don't know the exact part. I sympathize with you when I was chief recovery officer. We got the money before we got the rules as well. Um, and I know we're all going to be figuring out what pots can be used for what. Um, but $6 million for initial service grants to low-income families. Um, so it often costs $100, $200, up to $600 to get service started. To qualified low-income families, the state would cover that for two years. This is all a temporary program. It's a program uh, that sunsets when the uh, rescue money is gone. Also during this period, we pay continuing service subsidies to the very neediest families, to the families who not only can't afford to get hooked up, but can't afford to pay the monthly bills either. Um, and we'd require a 20, we're proposing it to be a $25 copay, uh, but that none of those very low income families have to pay more than $25 a month to get service. The ones who are in the area where they're already uh, low income programs don't have that problem. For example, Comcast's program is a little over $10 a month. So no call for subsidies to those families. And then we're also- could I just, could I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. Madam Chair. Dr. Pearson, you have a question? Yeah, Tom, you said what we're asking for is $6 million. Could could you help me understand who we is? And, and sure. I, I was thinking you were uh, somebody with, I gather, vast expertise, but it sounds like you have a proposal. So if yes. you ground me in that, I'd be grateful. And perhaps yeah. I- And perhaps the way I should say it is, I'm, um, I'm speaking for, for an organization which just set itself up called Broadband Equity Now, which does not intend to operate anything, uh, but just to advocate for this program and try to get it off to a running start. So when I say we're asking for, what I really should be saying is I'm asking that the legislature appropriate these amounts for these purposes. Uh, the amounts that are appropriated uh, to give families aid directly um, would go on behalf of those families to the providers that were servicing them. Uh, the amounts that are allocated for what we're calling the broadband core uh, would go to whichever part of state government or designated agencies or other organizations were providing these services. So, the, uh, Senator Pearson, I, I, I'll state that better. We're really asking that this be appropriated rather than it be given to some organization that I represent. So thanks for the question. Uh, the purpose of having the, the broadband core is to help families who need the help get access. Um, Madam Chair? Senator McDonald, you have a question? Um, we got a broadband expert who hasn't defined broadband for the purposes of his testimony. It, it, uh, it's coming up in a slide or two, Senator McDonald. Oh, I, okay. perhaps, I'll, perhaps you could tell us what you mean and what your organization means that you are representing when you use the term broadband. That let's wait. Easier. Let's wait until we get to the slide. We've been told it's there. Oh, Madam Chair. Senator. Okay. Um, Go ahead, I, 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 will, I, I will get to that in just a second. Um, the, the reason for having a broadband core is that we can't expect families who haven't been connected uh, to just Google, how do I get connected and then watch the YouTube. Uh, that the families that have been on the wrong side of the broadband gap uh, need help in getting connected and may need help in accessing the aid that's available to them. Uh, the, of the families that would be eligible for the financial help, um, the majority of them, 70% of them, the ones in the orange, are in the areas that are served by our current high cost providers. That is, those are would be customers of EC Fiber, of some of the smaller telephone companies who live in areas where there's no currently no carrier low income plan. Uh, they would get a subsidy. That would be good for the period of the subsidy for those providers because they'd get new customers uh, in their existing footprint. And of course, most important, it's good for those families because they could get online. Uh, and in the teal, um, about 30% of the subsidies would go to families in the areas that we've been considering unserved in those 60,000 addresses uh, that are unreachable. Uh, 
We've been thinking a lot, and, and this goes directly to Senator McDonald's family, of Senator McDonald's question of what should we be considering as broadband? Uh, we don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. On the other hand, we don't want people to have a service in that substandard, uh, even in the short term. So if you look at the things that people need to be able to do. They need to be able to teleconference, so they did telehealth, remote education, uh, work from home. All of that depends on teleconferencing. Uh, if you had a very high definition television or computer, you'd need about four megs, a little less than that, in each direction for each teleconference that you're doing. Most people are teleconferencing at uh, 0.8 meg or 2.6 meg. Um, and if they're going to do a couple teleconferences, parents are working from home, kids are doing their homework, um, then they're going to need twice that. Uh, watching video, you don't really need any uplink capability to speak up. You need a lot of downlink if you were. Uh, watching high definition, you need about five megs down for each stream that you're watching. Ultra high definition, which is unlikely that low income people are looking at right now because you need an expensive television, expensive computer to get it can use as much as 25 minutes. So what we're saying um, is that we should, that the minimum, and this minimum has to change over time, but the minimum service to qualify for these subsidies in the beginning uh, should be 50 megabits down, five megabits up, uh, and with a latency of less than 150 milliseconds, as, as it currently says in the state law. Um, that's higher than the standard that the state was using as an interim standard before 25-3, uh, because that was really a pre-pandemic standard. And I think with as much as people have come online now, um, we have to move that up. Will that be enough forever? Absolutely not, uh, but it's enough to get started. Uh, and then year after year, there has to be authority in the state to keep ratcheting that standard up. Um, if we look at uh, accessibility, uh, the current department maps show that the 60,000 E911 addresses without a qualified provider, meaning somebody who provides more than 25.3 in the state's case. Um, it'll take a minimum of five years uh, to get to all of those addresses with a fiber build out. I'm not suggesting that we don't do the fiber build out, we wanna do it. What I am saying is we can't ask people to wait five years to get connected. We can serve people at the end of the road, the ones the fiber build out isn't gonna to get to for a long time, almost immediately, not quite immediately, but almost immediately by giving them access to wireless services, primarily right now Starlink, but there's also 5G coming along. There are competitors uh, to Starlink that are in the pipeline. Uh, the good thing about the wireless connectivity, obviously, is we don't have to provide the middle mile before we can get to the end of the road. Um, that with wireless, particularly with satellite, uh, a remote location can be brought online uh, as easily as a location that's near an urban area. So since we have these technical alternatives, uh, the problem of accessibility has really become a problem of affordability. All right. What we're recommending, uh, because again, this, we don't want to fund a perpetual program with one-time funds. Um, is that we use the allocation of funds uh, for construction, which of course you'll be doing alongside this. This isn't the construction program, this is the Get People Connected program. Um, we use that program as a way to make sure that low income plans are available throughout the state. And I would suggest doing that by requiring that any ISP that accepts funds under these programs be required to offer a low income program immediately in new territories that are built out with these funds. Uh, so low income program would uh, have to cost not more than $25 a month and would have to meet those minimum standards we talked about. After, uh, and, and that's certainly justified because their cost of construction is being partly offset uh, by the ARPA funds that you're allocating to them or that the authority is allocating to them, whether it buys down their interest rate or it actually buys down their amount of capital. The return that the state gets for that investment um, is that there, part of the return is that there is a low income plan available. And then after two years, we'd require if they had an existing territory 
that they off, also offer a low income plan in that territory. Uh, I think the ISPs gain by that, the state gains by that, and it gives us a way to sunset the state subsidies without taking the money away from the people who needed to be subsidized. Somebody who had a low income plan one year because the state was paying the rest of the bill beyond $25 will have a low income plan in the next year uh, because that low income plan has been offered by a provider and they qualify for it. The way we see this happening, if we, if we look back to the pre-pandemic days, um, to uh, March 1st of 2020, just before everything hit us, or we realized what was hitting us, uh, which uh, again, we had carrier low income plans available for the area in blue. Those people uh, were looking now just at low income families. And those low income families, let's say there were 60,000 of them uh, in blue, really had no problem with access as long as they knew how to get it. Um, we had no service available for the areas in orange and the broadband gap, the affordability gap was the area in red. Fast forward to January 1st of this year, we've had the virus. Let's say the number of low income families went up from 60,000 to 70,000. Broadband gap got even larger uh, because there were less people who could afford to pay for the services that were available to them. Come to April, um, and the good news is uh, it looks like the Starlink beta works very well. The Starlink is an alternative, not perfect, not as good as fiber. I'm on Starlink today, and you may see it blink if a branch goes, if a satellite goes past a branch in my yard. Uh, but it's there, and it's a lot better than nothing. So we have that alternative, but all that alternative does, as far as low-income people are concerned, is make the broadband gap even greater. There are more people now who could get service but they can't afford to get that service. All right. We've heard that as many as 10,000 Vermonters have signed up for Starlink. Those are the people who can afford it, uh, but certainly not low income people. If we put this plan in effect, and then we go to July 1st of this year, um, and we say that a state subsidy is available, then that green of state subsidy replaces the red of the broadband cap. Um, then wherever you are, wherever a family is in Vermont, that family will have a way to get access. The broadband core will help them get that access. Uh, as time goes on and the ISPs build out with the ARPA money that you've allocated to them, uh, then low income plans from the providers begin to replace the state subsidy. We get to the end of the period, everybody's connected or everybody wants to be connected to be realistic. Um, and we'd have no further need for state subsidies. The program has, subset, has sunset, but it's achieved its goal. It's closed the broadband gap. It's made our network more valuable uh, because a network's value really depends on the number of people who are connected to it. So if we look at the state expenditures, and I'll be brief on this, um, you can see that what we're proposing in fiscal year 22 is about 8 million. This is from our funds and CARES funds. Uh, about 14,000 in 2023 because we've gotten a lot of families signed up now and they're getting the monthly subsidy. Uh, and then it goes down over the next two years uh, because more and more low income plans are available from ISPs. Uh, and we've really talked about that timeline. You know, we've been promising universal broadband for years and, and I've been part of doing that. And this time it really can work. The reason it can work one is we have new technology, so we really can get to everywhere. Secondly, we have lots of federal money. We're not going to get an opportunity like that again. Uh, and we have state control, which is very important. When, uh, in the last stimulus, um, as the Madam Chair will remember, most of the money that went to broadband providers went right around the state. We really had no say in who got that money uh, or what they used it for. Matter of fact, the feds kept us very much at arm's length in that process. And of course, we don't have any direct regulatory control over broadband providers because of federal preemption. Um, so the state has been somewhat helpless uh, in governing the way that broadband providers act. But if we're the ones who are giving the money for a broadband build out, then we have a way to set conditions on what broadband providers do. Set quality conditions and also make sure uh, then an affordable program is a part of what they build out. 
I haven't, I haven't talked a lot about the broadband core, but, but as I said in, in response to your question, it's, it's really a, a, a virtual core. Uh, Mary has been doing a lot of work talking to community action agencies, CCB, 211, Equal Access Broadband, which is in EC Fiber Territory, uh, and others about ways to set up the broadband core. What we're trying to do is front run it. Uh, we're gambling uh, that you will appropriate money for there to be a broadband core. We want that to be able to hit the road running on August 1st. So we're trying to say what education is needed, what uh, procedures are needed, what agencies are best equipped to offer this service. Uh, if you don't appropriate the money, then there won't be a broadband core. Uh, but we're because it's so important that it get going quickly, uh, we're working on that now. Uh, you know, they, they, as we work with community action agencies, they tell us how much they, there's a need for universal broadband in Vermont. That they really can't help people with their health problems, with their education problems, with their other problems. They can't help families unless those families have access to broadband. So it's not just about broadband, but really universal broadband is foundational to the new, better Vermont that we want to build. We have an opportunity now. It comes from technology, comes from the federal money, comes from understanding what we need to do that we're not likely to see again. And uh, I think because we can do it, we we'll have to do it. We can close the broadband gap now. Thank you very much. Okay, so Tom, your basic proposal is that you are not supplanting the um, the expansion or the construction of more broadband. You're saying once it's out there, the problem is it's going by the house, but the folks can't afford to hook up um, every month. Um, I think we'll have to have some of the CUDs and folks in to talk to us about how that fits into their business model. And Holly Gosner is on the line, but I believe last time she was here, there is an organization out there working with people. So if you're available um, to talk to Holly, that there might already be something to plug into. Yeah, um, yeah. I, mean, I, I did mention them, by the way, I just went over that very quickly on the slide. Okay. called Equal Access Broadband, and Holly can tell you much more. Okay. Uh, so, a good start. All right. So rather than put all the money into construction, this would reserve, a, I don't know, 150. This would reserve money to go into that uh, moving, getting people hooked up. I've always wondered how you did your homework in the parking lot at Sub Zero. Yeah, didn't sound ideal to me. Um, and then eventually have it all go to the private sector. That would, or whatever. Yeah, yeah it would yeah, go I mean, into provider subsidy yeah. rather than once we run out of state money. Okay. Right, exactly. And it, no, the, nothing precludes that money going to the cuts or whoever can build right. up quickly. It just says, in the meantime, uh, people are connected. And it, it, you know, I've started a couple of network businesses. You always invest at least as much in customer acquisition to look at it from a business point of view as you do in actually building the network. Uh, Facebook doesn't have a network, uh, a physical network. And so what, what I'm saying is, even though this is one-time money, even though we're spending it on subsidies, those are really the cost of closing the broadband gap. Those are really the cost of making sure all Vermonters are part of our network. And having all Vermonters as part of our network makes the network much more valuable to all of us. Okay, maybe we'll find those, I forget how many thousands of kids who have not been seen in a year because they don't have broadband and they have disappeared. The school hasn't seen them. Senator Hardy, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tom, thanks for being here today. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to understand your your proposal. It's it's about uh, twenty six million dollar um, mm -hmm. that we would put mostly toward subsidies, a broadband core that I 
I, I think is supposed okay. to be like technical assistance and help for uh, people. Well, only five million would be for the technical assistance. The right, right. And then, and then some okay. for grants for equipment and setup. But the subsidy, and my understanding is you think that we should require anybody who has gotten state money for the build out to then provide a subsidized um, okay. service to people who are lower income. Is that correct? Yeah, a, a low income service that doesn't require a state subsidy. Okay, uh, but until we program. get there, until we get everything built out, you're proposing this $15 million subsidies for people to basically get the satellite service? Oh, not most of it would not go to the satellite service. It would when there was nothing else available. But for example, there are people living in EC fiber territory uh, for whom $100 a month or $90 a month is a lot of money. Um, and so this, during, those, during that time, subsidies would go to those people so they could buy the service that's available to them now. In this case, it would be EC Fiber. More families are in that circumstance than in the circumstance where there's no other alternative except satellite. Okay. All right. So All right. I was, under the, maybe so. I was under the impression that you were trying to say that we should just subsidize everybody who doesn't currently have internet to have to get the satellite link up. Okay. okay. No, um, absolutely not. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that, Senator. We could get them whatever service is available to them now. Um, and obviously within that, there's the cheapest service that meets the minimum standards. Uh, but in most cases, that's not going to be satellite. That's the last resort. So what happens for the, the programs, the ISPs who don't get, don't ever provide a low income plan? Are you assuming that all of them eventually will because they will have gotten some kind of state funding or or out of the goodness of their heart or what? <laughs> I, I, well, I, I'm assuming that the very big ones uh, will continue, Comcast, for example, will continue to offer their low-income plan. Uh, it's really good economics for them because once you've built out over a neighborhood, uh, it, you know, it's like an airline um, selling standby seats. They might as well sell to the low-income people as well. So I'm, I'm assuming that the probably national carriers will probably not participate in our programs. I don't know that, but that's what I'm assuming. Um, but that they will continue their subsidies. And that other ISPs uh, who don't take subsidies um, either will find themselves um, outcompeted by those who did, um, or that they'll find a reason, their own marketing reason, to... Um, to offer low income plans. Uh, there's also pressure from the feds and the money that's coming from the feds for there to be low income plans. Uh, there's FCC money that may offset some of what I've recommended appropriating. Uh, and I'm leaving that out of the equation because we don't know the rules yet, but if we have it, we have it. Okay, all right. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Senator. Sorry. Okay, are there other questions at this point? All right, we have at this point a 10 minute break and then we're gonna come back and Chris Campbell, who is the former director of the VTA and Holly Grossner, who is the legal counsel for the former VTA, are gonna to talk to us about lessons learned. So as we move forward, um, mistakes we can perhaps avoid going through their experience. So, um, Faith, if you can take us off live, everybody can stretch for a few minutes and then.